are living in a new era. The deepest technological revolution in human history. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm really excited at the conversation we're going to have today about immersive technologies, 5G, and AI, some of the hottest topics around, generating huge interest. I'm Edwina Fitzmaurice. I'm the Chief Customer Success Officer at EY and the Chief Product Officer. I'm also the partner in charge of our EY Metaverse Labs. Um, and that's a really interesting area. It's a really growing area. For those of you who are saying, is this real? Is it happening in the market? We're certainly seeing demand across every sector. We have 400 people working on immersive technologies, Web3 and AI. Huge interest happening in the market. So I'm very excited for the conversations we're going to have today. We have uh, some presentations for you. Then we're going to have a fireside chat, and then we're going to have a panel. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first presentation, which is coming from Snap, one of the real leaders in augmented reality. And they're going to talk to us about what's happening around augmented reality and AI. And they're going to be joined by Verizon. So if you would get ready to welcome Anne Lawrenson, who's the MD of Carrier Partnerships at Snap. And she'll be joined by Chris Sumas, who's the head of Consumer Content Partnership at Verizon. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Anne on stage, and I think we have a video to play first. Thanks. Did you know that every day on Snapchat, 250 million people engage with augmented reality? Augmented reality is digital content overlaid on the real world to make it more engaging, informative, and entertaining. When paired with the reach and power of 5G, we have found more creative freedom and greater accessibility to build transformative experiences that can be felt worldwide. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here with you today. I'm Anne Lorenzon, and I'm the Managing Director for Career Partnership at SNAP. For the past few years, we have worked together with mobile operators around the world to showcase immersive AR experiences powered by 5G. I will be joined today by one, one of our lead innovation partners, Verizon, who I will introduce shortly. But first, let me share a bit more about our platform and why we are leading in AR. Snap is a technology company. We believe that camera represents the greatest opportunity to improve the way people live and communicate. Meet the Snapchatters. 375 million daily active users, growing 70% year over year. The community is a highly engaged audience of Gen Z. We reach over 75% of the 13 to 34 years old in 20 countries. Snapchatters make use of our features to connect with friends and express themselves through AR lenses. 
At SNAP, we believe that augmented reality represents the next major shift in computing. But what makes AR and VR different? Unlike VR, AR doesn't require you to enter into a virtual world and put a headset. AR enhances our physical world with a digital overlay, anchoring digital objects to the people and places we love most. And in addition, AR is much, much larger than VR, with expected usage to grow to 4.3 billion users by 2025. So why is SNAP uniquely positioned to lead on AR? First, our advanced technology enables limitless creative potential. Today, 300,000 AR creators build new experiences with our tools. Second, as I mentioned earlier, 250 million Snapchatters interact with AR every day on our app. And last, we, you have probably already seen our advanced machine learning network lenses, although you might not even realize that SnapTech powers them. The Shook lens and the Crying lens both had over one billion impressions within a few days after launch. Thanks to these three pillars, creators, engaged audience, and best tech, Snap is leading the AR revolution. But with 5G, we can do even more. We build experiences for the real world. We want to focus on places where people gather, interact, and connect, like live events, sports events, music events. This is why we partner with visionary mobile operators around the world who believe in the power of AR and are building the networks of the future, like 5G and beyond. We can leverage faster connectivity, ultra low latency, and greater bandwidth to bring richer and more immersive experiences to our community and to the 5G subscribers. 5G allows us to leverage our most advanced tech, larger five sides that allow richer visuals, connected lens where thousands of fans can participate in the same experience, real-time gaming, with simultaneous play across our user base, and the list goes on. One of the partners that have joined us in this vision is Verizon. And I'm happy to introduce you to Chris Sumas, head of consumer content partnership at Snap, who has been our amazing partner. She will walk you, she will walk you through Verizon's strategy and some of the experiences we've built together. Chris. Thank you, Anne. So we love Snap because, as Anne said, they have a thriving community of creators and a really engaged audience. And at Verizon, we're really focused on giving ways for creators to create and making sure consumers can consume while propelling the industry forward on America's most reliable network. The combination of our network, recognized both for its performance and reliability and unique content partnerships, really makes us the partner of choice for consumers and creators alike. Verizon 5G is a game changer. Um, when it comes to internet bandwidth, of course, we've got super fast speeds, massive capacity, ultra low latency. And with Snap, we partnered to bring the 5G story to life for millions of creators and consumers. And we really created some first of their kind of experiences. We've always leaned into storytelling at Verizon to express the quality of our network. And doing so through immersive AR helped us target and reach a younger demographic that Snap really owns in the market. Um, we showcased the benefits of 5G via Snap lenses and basically helped make tech, Verizon's tech real to consumers in fun and practical ways. By working with Snap, we could delve into their arsenal of tech, whether landmarks or mocap or you know, bodied, uh, 3D body scanning, we were creating awesome things like this Black Pumas concert that was streamed over a landmark. We've also worked with their Snap Originals team and really just made you know, 5G come to life. 
We have deployed 5G across over 75 stadiums in the US. And we use Super Bowl 16 as a platform to show exactly what our technology can do. We showcase the speed and power of Verizon 5G and how it can impact the fan experience as well as business operations. With Snap, we, we leveraged Verizon 5G to create an immersive AR synchronous game that allowed fans in the stadium to compete and really like try to take control of a virtual airship floating over the stadium. Um, this couldn't have been done without 5G. You really need you know, the 5G to get thousands of players to compete together. We came again to the governor's ball. Um, this was a live event that we did with Live Nation. And essentially, we created this unique shared AR experience that allowed consumers on Verizon 5G and using Snapchat to collaborate to design the sky with stickers pulsating to the music. And for Snapchatters, we realized like, they could do these experiences in this very like, intense um, concert venue, and they could only do it with 5G. So while these were really fun to create, our, like these are the most popular projects for everyone at Verizon to work on. They love work, we love working with Snap. But not only are they fun to create as we're pushing boundaries forward, but they actually show results. We've seen that among the Snapchat audience, nearly half of them really recognize Verizon as the leader in 5G. We've also seen three times the playtime when it comes to 5G lenses. 33% more impressions on this governor ball lens versus the 4G lens, just showing how 5G gives people richer experiences, and 10 times higher viral, like share rate, among <clears throat> uh, folks who use that Snapchat game at the Super Bowl. This is the most important metric because there's nothing better than when a friend says, I want to share this with you. So we are super proud of our partnership with Snap. We've, we've really done a lot together, but it's just the beginning, and we have much more to come. So with that, Back to Anne. Many thanks, Chris. Many thanks for your continued support. So we are continuing to partner with Verizon and other visionary mobile operators to augment the real world. We want to develop innovative utility and entertainment use cases. It can be leveraging AR to understand a football game better, connect with your friend at the festival, or try on an apparel without even engaging with a physical product. We are excited about AR and how it will help transform the world around us through your smartphone today and in the long term through wearable technology like AR glasses. We hope you leave today with an understanding of the potential and the value of augmented reality and the type of transformative and wide-reaching experiences that are possible when paired with the power of 5G. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. And I will let uh, Edwina come back on stage. I love seeing those real world examples. I mean, the numbers there are kind of staggering, right, when you think of the number of people who are engaging with this. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. That was really exciting. Speaking of exciting, I hope you're all ready to hang on to your seats because who's coming up next is we're going to hear from McLaren Racing and Cisco about what they're doing around 5G, AI, and immersive technology. So I hope you're all excited to hear about that. I know I certainly am. So I'd like to welcome on stage Ed Green, the Chief Commercial Technology Officer at McLaren Racing, and Gigi Patel, the EVP and General Manager, Security and the Collaboration Business Unit at Cisco. And I think we're going to see a video to kick us off. Thank you. When it comes to F1 racing, speed, performance, and precision are paramount. In order to make an F1 car really competitive, you need lots of departments to talk together. No matter where they are. We often work from the track, where we might be using small devices in small meeting rooms, whether or not you're working from your hotel room on your laptop, or you're running around the place on your phone. That whole collaboration journey is seamless. When you're in a meeting with people over WebEx, you do feel like they're in the same room. Securely. The letting engineers know that when they're talking about parts of the car, that's our intellectual property, that's how we're going to go and win championships. That communication is secured. We get visual prompts and reminders when you're on calls to see their engine encrypted. Flexibly. And the best bit is you can pick that up on any device. If you arrive at the track and there's a desk mini in the team hub, you can jump on there and do your calls. Um, or if you're back at the hotel on your laptop, you can do the same. Or better still, pre-event if you're in the office, 
uh, you can fire up in front of a WebEx board uh, and join in and share and annotate. So people have got so much flexibility and that makes it a really democratized experience. All right, how is everyone? Uh, before we get started, by the way, I'm so excited to have my good friend Ed, um, Ed over here with me. But how many over here are Formula One fans? The show of hands. You've got a lot of addressable market, but you also have a lot of wallet share expansion. <laughs> so, um, uh, so that's great. So, Ed, uh, for those of us that don't know much about Formula One, actually, I've gotten to be uh, quite into it lately. But um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the sport and the business? Yeah, the, the business of Formula One is, is pretty epic. We're um, 23 races around the world, starting this weekend in Bahrain and finishing out in uh, Abu Dhabi at the end of the season in November. We're going to race in places like Miami, Vegas, Austin, uh, Barcelona, Monaco, and some you know, historic F1 races, as well as some places the first ever time. So it's going to be really exciting. Looking forward to it. 23 races to, to take an IT show on the road. We, we put a mobile data center everywhere we go. Uh, we've got to go and deploy a team of 120 people on the ground in each of those locations. Um, so it's like building your own office every single weekend, which is a bit weird and a bit unique. Yeah. Um, and the aim of the game, whilst you see all of those people at trackside, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We've got those 120 people in the, in the garage doing the work on the cars, helping to support us go racing. And then we've got over 700 people working live in weekend back at the base, back in uh, Woking in England in our factory. And we've got to make sure both of those environments are online working and talking to each other. So uh, no small feat, but really exciting. But the intensity is palpable. Like you, can, you can feel it. So uh, for those of us that are even Formula One fans over here, can you, can you tell us a stat that even they wouldn't know? Yeah, we just did the wrap report last month. We gathered 11.8 billion data points on our cars last season. Wow. Uh, so just running for two hours on a Friday, an hour or two on a Saturday, and a 90-minute race on a Sunday, in that very short time span, 11.8 billion data points across the cars, everything from suspension rates at 100 hertz uh, right through to lap time and GPS. Wow. And for those that aren't as technically into cars, you'll still find this stat amazing. So the 0 to 60 on a McLaren car is about 2.3 seconds. Any guess on how long it takes to change a tire in a car when the, when the, when the guys come in to uh, get wheels changed? Anyone? Two seconds. 2.1. Anyone? OK. It's 1.9 seconds. Uh, to change a tire in a car is less seconds than actually going from zero to 60 on a McLaren race car. It's, it's so fascinating. So, um, so let's talk about your business a little bit. So uh, during the peak of the pandemic yep. was a really interesting time for you because you wanted to provide immersive experiences uh, for your fan base. Uh, and it's, it's such a physical sport where you have to be there to feel the energy. So one, what challenges did you have as you were thinking about that and how did you tackle that? And what did you end up doing? Yeah, I think w when we go racing, it's not just about the fans in the grandstand, it's also about our partners and our guests in the garage. And, and you go in and you, you see the garage and the cars are in there, right? And you and yeah. I have stood at the back and yeah. uh, you hear the engine, you smell the oil. It's this really immersive experience. And it's also where we show off our, our technology, right? We, we've snuck behind the scenes and shown the, uh, the, the rack and the data center we take with us. I've shown your guests all the networking gear and yep. all the security that takes place across that environment. And you come the pandemic and none of that could take place. Um, and so we kind of had an idea in the office to create this pre and post game show. Yeah. Uh, and we actually built a TV studio. So never in my career did I think I'd be uh, a TV production manager for, for three or four months during the pandemic. And we went, we got really close in behind the scenes. We were using WebEx to deliver this to our, our fans and to our guests. Um, we had that secure connection where they could remote in, uh, they could watch the show, they could interact, they could ask questions. Uh, we also used it to bring in guests. Uh, teaching Mika Hakkinen, uh, two-time world champion, how to use WebEx to join us in our studio uh, was a lot of fun. Uh, but it was a really immersive way to bring people inside our garage and give them more access than you'd get through ESPN or Sky Sports. Um, and we did that during the pandemic, and it was hugely successful. It really changed our way of thinking about how we engage, how we deliver content. Um, and you guys were awesome partners throughout that for us. You were pushing us, making us think differently, uh, challenging us to go to the next step of getting people really immersed into the, those meetings, those calls. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun, but never did I think, you know, uh, the pandemic was really interesting. It allowed us to take risks. Yeah. And 
there was many challenges during the pandemic, but getting the investment from the business to go and build out these you know, television studios, to build out our video broadcast capability, um, those are things that had we not had it, I don't think we'd have ever got there, but uh, the business took the risk, we pushed forward, you guys really helped us and challenged our thinking, uh, and yeah, we built this pre and post game show that still lives on. Yeah, and actually the, the entire kind of notion of providing an immersive experience is such an important part of that. So talk to us a little bit about AR and VR. And by the way, for those of you that, um, that aren't familiar with this, um, this style of racing, the, the, you know, it feels like, okay, there's a driver that sits in the car and he, he, he or she drives around, but the physical stamina that's needed to have something go from zero to how, how fast does this car go? 200 miles an hour sometimes? Over, yeah. O over 200 miles, and then they actually break within a matter of seconds. Yep. Right? And so the physical level of intensity that's needed is just completely staggering. But talk about AR and VR and what specifically um, you folks are doing as it pertains to uh, immersive experiences. Yeah, I think the pandemic taught us that we, we could work from home successfully. And to go a step further, we could actually design a Formula One car from home. Uh, we were doing so by collaborating the features that were coming, you know, sharing screens in HD, then 4K, being able to annotate on screens. Those are really useful. You know, the, the Formula One car itself, the, the, we will put a car out that goes racing in Bahrain this weekend. And by the time it finishes the season, we will change over 80% of that car. So there's 70,000 parts. That's every 17 minutes in the office we're producing a new part for that Formula One car. You will change 80% of the car by the time the season ends. Yes, if, if the, whoever wins in Bahrain this weekend, the common rule is if you were to do nothing to that car, if you were to make zero changes, even if it won by seconds out in Bahrain, if you don't change it 23 races later, you'll be at the back of the grid. You know, some wow. weekends, the, the performance differentiator, I think in Barcelona, this out here last year, was 2% in time between the car in pole position and the car at the back of the grid. That's 2% margin covering our sport. So we are dealing in milliseconds. We are dealing in absolute precision. Um, but what's really exciting is some of the stuff, you know, how we then you know, evolve the world of design. So we, we proved that we could design Formula One cars during the pandemic. And now with that distributed work model, we're trying to prove can we build and manufacture cars with a distributed uh, hmm. manufacturing. So we're opening up a new manufacturing site just down the road. We're going to move a lot of our manufacturing capabilities out of our office, as beautiful as it is. It's a beautiful building, but a bit of a nightmare to work with at times. Um, and we're going to use the WebEx hologram technology to allow people to, as they're creating a physical part, as they're laminating or as they're machining something for the Formula One car, they can hold it up in front of the WebEx hologram and somebody back at base can put on a headset, load in the CAD model, and see the differences. They can start to compare and contrast and, and, and see what's useful. Um, that wasn't what we first wanted, tried it for. Uh, the first time I used hologram was with Lando. I was having a demo of the hologram technology. And Lando is one of your drivers. Lando is one of our drivers. Yeah. He's 24 years old, got millions of fans on Instagram. Uh, he's quite proud that he was voted the girl's popular, most popular driver. Um, but we'll leave, leave him to that one. But I was trying this WebEx hologram demo, and you guys asked me to sign a lot of NDAs, but this was a real serious, like, I remember I got the phone call being like, no, no, you cannot talk about this one to anybody. And um, I put the headset on and was completely blown away. And it was back when everyone was still doing the fist bump. That's right. One of your engineers in San Jose reached out to fist bump me. They were in front of this camera array capturing them. And I was watching this through a headset, and I felt like they were fist bump. You know, it was a really kind of unique moment. The person next door was blasting out music and making loads of noise, and I was trying to do this demo. So I flung the door open to ask them to stop it, and it was Lando, our driver, signing lots of baseball caps for our fans. And I said, well, stop doing that. This is way more cool. Come and have a look at this. <laughs> and he put it on and went, holy, I won't repeat it. Um, but he was amazed. He thought it was, like, it was one of the most immersive experiences he's had. He wanted to use it to design helmets. And he also thought he could stop going to press conferences. He could just sit in front of this unit at home in his flat. and. Uh, do all his press conferences remotely. But for us, it's, it's really moving forward. And I'm really curious like, how else you guys are seeing it. How did that come about? And, and how do you see AR and VR across that? We WebEx? actually, it was, it was interesting because when we started doing this project, the goal was, can you provide something? Because as people started talking about the metaverse, you know, there's one aspect which is provide avatars and half floating bodies in, 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 in a meeting. Um, we went the exact opposite route, which is can we provide photorealistic, volumetric, three-dimensional uh, experiences to people that make it look like you're right there. And the eventual goal of that is, you know, uh, Ed could be in London, I could be in Los Altos in California, and we could be breaking bread, and he could be sitting at my dining table, and I'd be able to look at him in three-dimensional kind of uh, 
vision. And so that's what we want to do. Now, by the way, there's some constraints on that. One is that the headsets are still pretty large contraptions, and you need to get them smaller. And ideally, it'd be nice to get it to, in the next few years, to the size of my glasses. Because once you do that, an entire new possibility opens up for what you might be able to do with, um, uh, with these technologies. But augmented reality um, with three-dimensional is actually uh, where we, we, we see a tremendous amount of potential. Um, and there'll be a spectrum with AR and VR, they'll start to merge over time where you'll have a spectrum from you know, the same device being able to do AR to VR. Um, and it'll be, it'll be really interesting to see, but we, th we feel like there's a tremendous amount of potential in creating these experiences where you feel you're right there with each other um, and, and the barrier of the technology just goes away and you feel like you're, you're sitting in my environment with me and the other person thinks I'm sitting in their environment with them. Um, so let me ask you a question. Um, as you start thinking about artificial intelligence, um, how is that going to actually play into McLaren and Formula One racing in, in general? Yeah, I think we've, we've done a lot already in terms of uh, machine learning. and We've got some really good neural networks out there building up uh, tire strategies and, and figuring out what we should do when we should bring the car into the pit lane. You know, you get sort of a couple of opportunities during the race to change your tires, and that's the real kind of uh, the way you're going to outperform each other at the, at the moment is picking your, your pit windows on track. Um, I've definitely used some of the new services and AI that are out there. I've asked it what it would do in terms of its, its strategy. Um, I think, you know, for me, it's about where we've got those challenges that are either huge in scale, you know, we're trying to process 20, 30,000 images worth of uh, analysis per weekend, or where we've got these things that need to be done really quickly, you know, speech to text springs to mind, or where you've got these massively complex challenges. You know, if you were to try and model a Formula One race, just the permutations of, is it going to rain? What if it rains on lap two? What if it rains on lap 22? What if it did this? What if it was this time? It's just so much. And so for those complex challenges, I think AI will be there. And I don't think of it as making the decisions, but I think it will definitely help support decision making decisions. in the future. Yeah. So I can see it you know, recommending to people uh, based on what it, it's seeing, based on how the AI models are working, uh, this is what it would recommend to do next. We've got some super, super smart people, but sometimes you've got to make decisions in as little as three seconds, right? If the safety car comes out because of an accident on track and you're coming around that final corner, you can only have three seconds to get in the pit lane. In those three seconds, you've got to decide what are we going to do? Are we going to bring the driver in? Are we going to keep them out? And there's two drivers to make that decision. Then you've got to decide what tires they're going to get. Then you've got to mm. brief the pit team. Wow. The crew. So it's so a lot to do there. So AI for me, I think, is going to be really, really important, but definitely a user-centric view. Yeah, yeah we've, we've actually seen a very interesting set of developments. Like we, We've done probably over a billion dollars of AI investments on, on the WebEx platform itself. Yep. And um, you know anything with language translation, with real-time language translation, is all done through... Um, through AI, we've actually got a tremendous amount of uh, noise removal technology. So when you actually, you folks use that quite in a bit. In the garage, for sure. <laughs> yeah, so in, in, in the garage, they'll actually have uh, uh, you know, kind of noise removal where you could be speaking to someone, but anything other than human speech can be suppressed. And so all the engine sounds can be suppressed when you're talking to the person. So on the far end, they feel like you're just talking to them and there's, there's no, no background noise. And then if you were on the near end, you could actually put on noise removal headsets and then you'd have, um, you'd have it on both sides. Um, but the big use case for AI, uh, and I'm hoping you folks will also see this, is around security as well. Where, you know, as you start seeing breaches happen in security, going out and dealing with that at machine scale is going to be the only way to go out and address some of the adversaries that are out yeah, there. Yeah, I think w during the F1 weekend, we see about a 17% spike in attacks. And uh, people are brilliant, right? We've got really clever engineers, but nobody can escape some of the sophisticated right. attacks happening now. And so you need to respond at machine speed to those attacks as they come through. So um, walk us through, because at some point you're going to just defy laws of physics uh, with how much more you can do. So what does Formula One look like in the next five to seven years in your mind? Um, yeah, it's an interesting space to push into. I think. You know, previously it was about being the biggest and the noisiest and the fastest. And now I think it's about being the most efficient. Mm. So the engines we're producing now are, are becoming more and more efficient. They're becoming more, um, you know, maybe less noisy, which some people don't as enjoy as much in the sport. We're a, we're a sport at the end of the day. Um, but I think what we'll be doing is, is how do we be more efficient? How can we inspire other industries? How can we inspire uh, the fuel manufacturers of this world? Do you ever see electric vehicles uh, being the Formula One cars? Or would that just take away from the spirit of the whole thing? 
you know, we have an electric racing team. We have two, two entries. We've got a, a four by four. So we've got one that gets very muddy, which is new for us. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got an electric racing team who are uh, out. Uh, they just, their third race of the season. So I think the two remain separate, but I think F1 is such a catalyst for innovation, right? It's, uh, it's where all of our partners come together, you guys included, to help us push things forward. It's helping us look at new biofuels. And I think it's this, uh, this crucible, right? We know when we're going racing, you right. can't avoid it. You know at two o'clock, on this day, we'll be racing in this country at this time. You've got to show up and you've got to be there. Um, so I think Formula One will continue to drive and push innovation forward. I think our tech partners are doing awesome work in you know, both individually and collaborating. Um, so I think, yeah, in the future of Formula One, I don't think you'll see weird and wacky wings, but I think you'll see the cars being more efficient and That's driving awesome. it into the road. Well, Ed, we could, we could chat for hours about this stuff, but I know that we need to get to the next speaker. So uh, thank you to Ed, and uh, if you, um, if you do get a chance, go attend one of the Formula One races. It's a life-changing experience. And thank you again for the partnership. We're excited to be a technology partner for you and I appreciate everyone's time. I'll hand it back to you. Well, I can tell you I'm a huge Formula One fan, so I'm very excited to hear all that's going on at McLaren Racing. It's a great sport and uh, really kind of at the edge of technology. So I love hearing about AI and immersive technologies and how they're, how they're using it there. Um, I am really excited to welcome a great panel. We're going to actually get into some really good conversations. So I might ask our panelists to join us and please welcome them on stage. So welcoming. How are you all? Please grab a seat. We've got Hugo Swartz, who's the VP and General Manager for Metaverse and XOR Qualcomm. Hey, Hugo. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, we have Misha Dohler, who's joining us as, uh, from Ericsson's. He's the VP of Emerging Technologies. How are you doing there, Misha? Hello. Great. And uh, Milan Kulkarni, who's the VP and Head of Wireless Labs at InterDigital. So please, yeah, let's give it up for our panel, please. Good afternoon. All right, so what I'd love to do just to kick us off is to get you know, a little bit more about each of you. Tell us about your role in your organization and what your kind of particular interest is. So Hugh, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Maybe you could tell us about what you do at Qualcomm. Okay, well, first of all, I really, really love the theme. You know, XR, AI, 5G, uh, three big trends that are coming together. And, um, and I think they come together to enable what many are calling the spatial internet maybe use it equivalent to, to the metaverse. And, uh, and we can all see the, from history, when we had the first internet, PC was the key enabler, right, DSL. Um, then came um, uh, 3G, data over wireless, and the mobile internet came. And now I think that you know, XR, both VR and AR, together with 5G, but now with AI, is what's gonna, is gonna create this let's call the third phase of the internet. And um, at a Qualcomm, so I'm the general manager, um, and uh, one of the, the key issues that I think uh, G2 mentioned, you know, for us to enable this world is to make you know, VR and AR headsets smaller. And that's um, you know, one of the key things that we do at Qualcomm. Uh, we do you know, high performance, low power, with high speed connectivity. You know, we do the processors, the technology, reference design and enable ecosystem. So that's um, a bit of uh, my role and how Qualcomm is uh, helping the industry in this journey. Great, well we'll look forward to asking a few questions about that in a few minutes. Sure. Uh, maybe I'll move on, maybe Misha, could you introduce yourself next please and tell everybody about what you do? Yeah, hello, good afternoon. So my name is uh, Misha Dola, I'm uh, Vice President for Emerging Tech uh, in a fascinating engineering shop called Ericsson. So we don't produce phones anymore, but we do the uh, infrastructure, 5G infrastructure. I sit in Silicon Valley and I do three things which I'm very excited about, which is uh, you know look uh, after our emerging tech portfolio, so that is 5G, 6G, quantum, blockchain, uh, AI naturally, right? So, and uh, I also look a lot after our XR engagements, so implementation, you know, with our wonderful partners, uh, make that really happen from a uh, from commercial point of view. And I also sit on the on the board of um, Ofcom and the FCC, so I look a lot after regulatory problems we have in that space. So, and you know, Ericsson, we understand it's, a, it's, a, it's an ecosystem play, so, you know, even though we just uh, own one segment of that whole play, we really think 
think it's it's a wider play and we we, we kind of zoom out we we kind of understand it's really a, a demand supply and regulatory game really and we're trying to address that from all angles and uh, you know from a from a supply point of view uh, you know we have the we have the devices right we just talked about this and uh, they're doing really fantastic work there to push the envelope when it comes to you know AR and, and VR we are of course excited about AR uh, so we have the devices we have the networks we take care of that we I think we do pretty good magic there and then we're waiting for the applications you know we heard some for the fascinating applications from Chris and Anne before um, so that is on the on the uh, on the supply side on the demand side you know the 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 business model is i think the biggest headache we have as the in the industry at the moment and uh, you know we, we are still looking at ARPU models we're still the the industry which looks at you know how many sim cards have we sold today and uh, probably with xr we can do a bit better there but we have also upped the game so ericsson acquired a company called vonage uh, for a whooping six billion dollars and uh, it's quite a bold game i have to say but it's an api company and uh, the idea is really to, to push the envelope when it comes to the business model, say let's move away from ARPU to API charging and see where that brings, uh, where, where it brings us actually, right? So, and I'm personally very excited about maybe the long-term future. Can we learn something from the blockchain community? Can we learn something from the, the tokenomics? And uh, you will have a fascinating panel, I think, after us. And uh, you should really tune in. I think it's all related, really. So, and regulation is a huge headache, to be honest. Uh, Spectrum is probably the biggest problem of any of the uh, operators in the room, any of the regulators in the room. We've done a lot analysis. If by 2020, 2026, 27, you know, we we uh, we only have 10% XR uptake, and uh, if we don't do anything about Spectrum, we're going to run out of capacity. So it's uh, it's a real bummer. So we need we need to really deal with the uh, Spectrum issues. Uh, please lobby the regulators around the, the world, the ITU. Uh, we have net neutrality issues to sort out, specifically the um, you know non-specificities around this, and then uh, also certification. I don't know Hugo, if you have that problem, but. Uh, you know, a lot of the device manufacturers here told me that, you know, integrating 5G natively into the into the glasses, you know, is uh, the certification process is actually very complicated. So there's a lot of stuff we need to do. So it's, it, it is exciting, but a lot of homework, you know, it pays my, pays my salary, which is good, you know. Right, well again, I have a whole bunch of questions lining up for you on the back yeah. of that. Um, but there's great, I mean, great opportunities, but also great challenges, Misha. So I'd love to dive into that with you in a minute. Milan, tell everybody a little bit more about you, please, and your role. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you for having me here. It, it's really my pleasure. Uh, very exciting topic, as you said earlier, a uh, very hot topic. Uh, in this, I've, I've been feeling kind of cold <laughs> in these halls, but you know, it's ni nice to talk about all these exciting hot topics, so it keeps me warm. Uh, a little bit about myself, I've been in the telecom industry since the GSM days, so I've seen the evolution over time, uh, starting with digital voice, data, video, and, and today, as, as we look at the internet traffic, more than 80% of the traffic is all video, right? And, and so, as, as part of Interdigital, the company where I work, I, I manage the wireless piece of it. We do the research and standardization. We have a couple other labs. One is the video lab, which is also looking at how do we improve the video compression or performance of the entire network by reducing the size of the data we're pushing through or the video we're pushing through. And we have a third lab which looks at more emerging technologies. You know, if you consider AI ML as one of the emerging themes that we're going to talk about a lot. So, so we also look at how do we include those technologies in the wireless and the video world. So what is unique about us, right? You know, you, you all know about Qualcomm's and the Ericsson's and the other big companies that we talk about. We've been around 50 years, and, and over the 50 years, we have developed a lot of pioneering technologies, which lay the foundation of the 4G and the 5G. So I was so excited to see SNAP present how the 5G technology is getting used, because it, it, it makes us proud to develop the foundations of those technologies. And as we talk about XR and AR and the VR, and the other things that are gonna come along, we have to constantly think ahead in terms of what are, 
what's already working in 5G and how we can continue to improve it, whether it be in the video side or the wireless side, and we work through the standards. So we participate in MPEG standards, IEEE 802.11 standards, and 3GPP standards and so forth to bring our innovative solutions into standards bodies so that we could standardize things and things will just work automatically once the specifications are developed based on that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Yeah, great. So Misha, I'm gonna come back to you just to start with yeah. some of the things. You talked about demand, you talked about supply. Right. You know, we're here at uh, Mobile World Congress you know, people, some might say the 5G is, is a, an answer that's been looking for a problem for <laughs> some time. So <laughs> great to see the numbers there at like Snapchat talking about, you know, 4.3 billion AUs, AR users by 2025. So is this the moment for 5G or 6G, whatever's coming? Is this the moment for the telcos? Is this the time when the telcos really kind of lean in to this immersive, sometimes called the metaverse, suite of technologies that are coming at us. What, what do you think about that? Should we all be excited here about all of this? Or? Oh, we should be excited. Yeah. You know, I mean, definitely last year, I think, you know, Exxon, and Metaverse was the hottest topic on the block. Yeah. Of course, this year it's uh, ChatGPT, you know, so, and, uh, you know, I, I've been trying Bad. to train ChatGPT to at least answer. I, I can't really answer that question, but try XR, you know, <laughs> so. No, it's, it's. Um, I think 5G is the uh, very first technology which allows us to get close to the type of um, technical KPIs we need to make that happen, you know? So we need, uh, we need of course, bandwidth, we need, uh, we need latency, but we also need jitter. So that's something we learned uh, the hard way. You need very low jitter. And uh, you not only need that as a proof of concept in a room, in, a, in an enterprise rollout on a 5G network, you actually need it nationwide and uh, very consistent. And uh, you know the latency we do have and the jitter we have very consistent at the moment is Volti. So whenever you do a voice call, all the operators agreed on these latencies, about 120 milliseconds for voice and 105 milliseconds for video. We need exactly the same way for XR. So what, uh, what we are really trying to do is to, to uh, mobilize the ecosystem. These are you know the, the Qualcomm's, the NVIDIA's, the Equinix, the operators of this well, the Ericsson's, uh, to really come together and build these, uh, you know, these very consistent ultra low latencies so we can offload stuff to the edge because we realized that, uh, you know, bringing the screen closer to the eyes is, uh, requires, you know, a, a much higher resolution. So 4K on the glasses is really not good enough because, you know, 4K on the iPhone is great, but 4K here, we need probably more. We need to render remotely lower latency, so we need to, to get these networks up and running. But 5G is the first step, I think. 5G Advanced will be the next answer, and 6G will give us you know, that extra scale. But, but I think it's, a, it's an exciting time to, 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 be, to, to be involved in this, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe just add uh, <laughs> something on, uh, on Misha. I think uh, you know, our vision is definitely much aligned to what you said. And um, I think the key word is uh, distributed processing. Exactly. Right, if you need uh, the super rich uh, visuals that you talked about, Sometimes you need 100 watts, 200 watts. Mm. You can't put 100 watts in your head, yeah. right? And especially if you want uh, you know, a very small form factor glass, such as the one I think was uh, the previous panel was talking about, well, you probably need to be under a watt. Mm. And, um, and that you know, requires uh, a lot of innovation on silicon, a lot of innovation on, on algorithms, uh, because again, you need a lot of AI you know, to Im think about, you know, um, computing space, that means, uh, you know, you have a hologram or you have a digital content in front of you, um, you need to understand the environment. Mm -hmm. You need to understand where the floor is, you know, where are the objects. You need to understand how my body is moving, my head is moving so I can render appropriately. I need to do eye tracking, hand <coughs> tracking, so a lot of AI. So you need to do that mostly in the glass because it's super low latency, you need to have that um, uh, done. But then again, the rendering and some of the more um, intensive uh, workloads, to the edge. you can't yeah. necessarily do it all in the glass. Yeah. And then the thing is though, um, it's also hard to put 5G on a small form factor glass. Mm. You know, I think it's gonna be still a little while until we get there, um, just if you want to make it small form factor. And then that's why, you know, we believe that um, the phone or even a PC is still going to be part of this architecture where you can distribute processing between the glass, maybe your phone, and the cloud. Right. So then uh, actually I, I invite uh, you all, we have a demo like this in our, our booth. 
um, talking about this distributed processing. But really, I think uh, that's where um, a lot of the industry needs and is coming together on how to architect um, this uh, the solution for um, really AR glasses to become mainstream. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, one of the things that strikes me talking to everybody at this conference is what an ecosystem play this is. I mean, we need the glasses, we need the user base like Snapper creating, we need the telcos, we need tech. Like there's everybody kind of needs to move forward together yeah. uh, to make the whole experience work. So Hugo, just let me stick with you for a minute as we think about the telcos. Um, you know, we heard there from Misha about needing to get, you know, high, very high speeds, low latency, at the edge, coverage models, very high resolution. You know, do you think the telcos are willing to make the investment that it's going to take? Because that's not all, not all in place right now. So there's, there's quite a lot there. I not only believe it, but I see it. You see it? Okay. Um, you know, one uh, very good example is uh, what uh, Docomo is doing in Japan. Uh, they created a whole subsidiary Q to address um, augmented reality end to end. So um, um, actually, you know, two days ago, we, we announced a big um, partnership with the seven uh, leading operators on how to tackle, you know, this problem. What exactly is the role of the operator? And uh, we, we put kind of a three buckets, you know, that uh, operators are working on. Um, one is uh, the actual service. Right, be it entertainment, be it enterprise. Just today, as you have your home services, you know, at home, you know, TV channels and so forth, you know, you can create uh, your content um, aggregation um, and and services to consumers and enterprise. So that's one uh, that we see a lot of um, uh, investment from the operators. Um, and then um, second is the connectivity, of course. Um, you know, the, the 5G networks being optimized. You know, there are certain um, parameterization and optimizations and continue to work on standardization of, of some of these uh, and not only 5G but Wi-Fi as well you know for home coverage and and so forth and the third one is the infrastructure right be it you know some call them the the Mac right the mobile edge uh, uh, compute so if I'm offloading uh, compute to the cloud well it can't be too far yeah. from the base stations and, um, and then, you know, uh, this more distributed or edge type compute, you know, will be demanded. Uh, another one, mapping, credentials. So all that infrastructure, you know, and, um, you know, in talking to operators, you know, through the last um, years, but now in particular, I see them ready. I see them doing that investment. But of course, uh, still investigating how much to do in Mac versus other cloud players and so forth a very interesting moment in time for telcos. For sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of people think we talked about the hype cycle, immersive, the metaverse, it was all big hype. Now it's gone to AI, right, which is great, actually. Yeah. I think this, this transition is actually part of a bigger structural change. So it's great to hear you talking about the telcos making those investments now and that it's happening now and seeing what's going on with Snap and others. Um, about this is a real thing that is happening now, even though it's a, probably a disruption that's going to take us 10 years to fully fully get to, yeah. Um, speaking of AI and uh, the hype that's going on, uh, Melinda, I want to just kind of come back to you on that. Um, as you think about AI and, and what's going on here around immersive and AI, can you th give us any examples or ideas about how you think that can play into the world that we're talking about here? XR, AI, 5G, any thoughts to share with us to put a bit more meat on the bones there? Milind, that's for you. Was that from yes, me? I apologize. Yeah. Um, so let, let me first start with you know a couple of points y you made and, and elaborate on that a little bit, um, and I'll come back to the point Thank that you. you mentioned or you raised. So you, in, you mentioned KPIs. So these are the key performance indicators. Today's networks, um, the way we look at it from standardization perspective, there are some key things we look for. How does a network behave? when you put traffic through it. And as we start talking about XR or immersive experiences, we, we have to evolve those measurements. We have to evolve how do we gauge the goodness or the quality of the network. And so we're, we're looking at that from quality of experience point of view. And, and that is going to be really a key to the success of 
how well people perceive the XR experience will be. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, all the challenges that we see today in being able to um, either support the latency, the, whether the processing is done at the edge and how do you put the AI on the edge intelligence and, and how do you then increase the, the throughput or the capacity of the network. So the, we're looking at all of those and, and all, you know, these things will come gradually as, as the 3GPP standardization will move through 5G advanced, which is release 18 today, and moving into slowly 6G. So we do have one European Commission funded program that we're working on called 6G XR, which we are very excited about. So we are also looking ahead to see what sort of improvements can we bring on AI, whether AI can be, um, AI is a tool, right? So we use the machine learning to improve where we can improve within the network, whether it's at the physical layer, whether it's at the higher layer, whether it's at the core network layer, because the end objective is to make sure that we are actually going to either save power, save computing requirements, save the energy, and, and or improve the spectral efficiency. So how do we do that and solve some of the problems that we haven't solved today is, is really something that we're tackling on. And, and just to say a little bit more about standards, how they're approaching this, uh, today we see some use cases coming into discussions where our engineers are looking at metaverse services. So, uh, or another one is immersive video conferencing. And, and these things are being discussed where we're looking at then to implement these use cases, how do we bring in the hyper-reality where the reality is augmented with virtual or you know, contextual information, or how do we bring sensing element that will give you a body movement and rendering of the body movement into your video conferencing, which some of our earlier colleagues talk about in terms of the holographic images or having the holograms into the system. So there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. I can talk all day long, but I, you know, in the interest of time, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, and, you yeah. Know. No, thanks, Melinda. I, again, you know, it's interesting listening to the panel and what went earlier that a lot of people are here are talking about hyper-reality mm -hmm. and AR, more so than the sort of VR avatar kind of world. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I'm certainly picking that up here. So not everybody in the audience here is going to be from telcos. So I'd love to hear, and we talked about ecosystems, so I'd love to hear from you, maybe the panel. Misha, I might start with you. You know, industries outside of telco, what, you know, who are you partnering, you don't have to tell us, but like what industries are you seeing that are really kind of going for this? And maybe I'd hear from you from Qualcomm as well. Yeah. Who are you partnering with? What industries? Is it banking? Is it sports? Is it entertainment? Is it retail? Is it metals and mining? Like where, who's using these technologies and where do you see the kind of those first movers getting an advantage? Yeah, we'll start with you, Misha. Uh, that's a billion dollar question, right? So where's yeah. the demand really? Uh, I recommend everybody to read our, you know, the Ericsson Consumer Report. We do that every year. We ask loads of people, what do you think? People in the streets, right? So this is not my opinion, not who is, not yours. It's a, uh, you know, we ask uh, the, 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 the normal people would use that every day actually out there. And we queried about 40,000 people this time and asked them, you know, if you were to use AR, you know, what would it be? So we compiled that information and uh, uh, the report is online, it's all available and you can read it there. There are no massive surprises, but my, my recommendation would always be start there. The second recommendation I would make is, you know, make it XR native, right? So companies like Snap, they really, uh, they really made it because they were mobile native, right? So you guys started really mobile native. There was nothing else for you to think about and it just exploded. So I think for any company to succeed, Seed, you know, choose the right sector, but you know, don't 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 take your own opinion as a, as the opinion. Go what the market says, and then uh, go XR device native. If you know, if Qualcomm fires out the yeah. AR reference designs, maybe they're going to do that. You yeah. know, with uh, with Niantic, you know, take this and try to build something and see how far we can push it. Right? That's how I would do it as an entrepreneur. Yep. Well, that's how we are doing it. Yeah. But um, right. I, I think that's a very good um, conversation that, hey, it's not only about the hardware, it's not only about uh, the, the technology, it's about the content and applications that, you know, really will uh, be used by consumers and enterprise. 
And uh, actually, I do see a lot of virtual reality as, uh, still. You know, I think uh, you know when I when I compare VR, what what the PC is to VR is what the phone is to AR. So I still think that there is going to be this different level of immersions that are going to be used. If I want something uh, more immersive, well, then I'll probably have uh, something that looks more like VR. But of course, that's becoming smaller. But yeah, let me get into the content, <laughs> right? So in in, um, in content today. We see a lot of uh, enterprise use cases, in particular in training. Um, you know, in the Accenture booth, I, I, I saw some fantastic uh, demos of, uh, of training. You know, imagine uh, someone in, in the um, uh, manufacturing line, you know, having to learn how to operate, you know, an equipment. Sometimes it's even dangerous mm -hmm. to learn on the equipment itself, but you can build muscle memory by using virtual reality. So I think learning is big, medical, so many uh, use cases, uh, customer of ours, uh, they build a VR headset for stroke rehabilitation. So, you know, those are not necessarily, you know, the flashiest um, uh, use cases, but they mean a lot to a lot of people, and uh, we see that growing. And to, to help foster, you know, this ecosystem, uh, we actually created a program, we call it Snapdragon Spaces, uh, which has uh, APIs following many standards like OpenXR, which enable this uh, spatial computing, and that we see so many um, applications and services being generated. Uh, Lufthansa, as an example, they're demonstrating in our booth. They, they have, you know, they are using a Lenovo AR glass to show, you know, big customers, how is the new business class? Mm -hmm. And you can walk around it, you know, interact with it. So a lot of enterprise uh, use cases and then in, in consumer, um, you know, gaming, of course, is, you know, front and center, but things like fitness, a lot of popularity uh, increasing, and, um, and social interactions. I think those are the, the, the spectrum of, uh, of applications. And, um, you know, just uh, complementing what you said, yes, the metaverse hype, you know, is, is um, slowing down, which is natural, but you know, I don't think that whether we use the word metaverse or spatial computing, I definitely see it um, happening and the industry investing heavily um, to do so. Yeah, I'd agree with you. Certainly we're seeing that, it, the same trends, healthcare, life yeah. sciences, manufacturing, yeah. all of that training, onboarding, recruitment is happening on the enterprise side. Governments are starting to move in a much stronger way where there's a lot more ac activity there. Um, and I think, of course, retail and consumer products is very, very busy as well, whether it's high-end fashion goods or car companies. There's a lot of action um, in the whole entertainment space as well. So we're running out of time. Um, I can see the clock here in front of me. So we might start wrapping up, and I, I think I'll just go to each of you. I'll start with you, Millen, to say, you know, are there any kind of parting words? There's obviously great opportunities here. There's also challenges. You talked about standards, and that's going to be a real challenge in pulling it together. But I'd ask each of you just to give a minute um, on, you know, closing comments for the group about, you know, next steps, opportunities. You're passing. You're you're leaving. Your thoughts to leave with the group. So, Milland, I'll start with you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Interdigital showed a wireless telephone, I don't know if you know or not, in 1976 in Philadelphia, at the same time when the United States was celebrating bicentennial celebration, in the same place where Alexander Graham Bell demonstrated a telephone 100 years earlier. You might think, why am I referring back <laughs> so far back while we were talking about the future? I just want to point out, we have come a long way but I still feel like we're at the cusp of the new beginning because there is so much more to come. And you know, I'd like to invite you to come to our stand, uh, Hall 7, B31, where we have AI-enabled immersive experiences we're showing on the wireless side. Also on the video side, we could show you immersive video, what it looks like on the virtual reality, on the augmented reality, and how we are using the video compression to reduce from something like one and a half gigabits per second to four to five megabits per second type improvements. So stay tuned, a lot more to come. Great, thanks. Misha, 
Any parting words for the audience? Yeah, you Slide know, I, minutes, I, 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 I suggest we stick to the game plan, right? So I, I wasn't joking when I said ChatGPT is the hot thing in Silicon Valley at the moment. It's a bit of a problem because a lot of capital will, will go elsewhere. Let's stick to the game plan. You know, it's, I think XR is a great opportunity. We're building the next generation uh, spatial internet. Um, let's do it. Let's see it through. You know, we, we, we need to come together as an ecosystem and, 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 and do it. That would be my, my thinking, you know? Yep. I love it. Hugo. Yeah, I mean, um, a similar message as, uh, as Misha. I think Qualcomm, we are a big foundational technology uh, provider, and therefore, uh, we work with, uh, with OEMs, we work with telco par uh, partners, we work with infrastructure uh, vendors, um, application developers, and um, um, uh, governments, and, and so forth. So I think that for us it's very clear, spatial computing is happening. It's a very similar journey that we went through with the mobile internet, when in the beginning everyone was questioning the use cases. I started working in the early 2000s uh, trying to sell data, and that was the, exactly the same questions. Oh, the device needs to get better, the speeds needs to get better, the content needs to come, same movie. <laughs> so I think that, uh, I, I think my key message is, hey, you know, yeah, don't, don't worry about hype, no hype, this is happening. And uh, Qualcomm is here to work with the, the various players in the industry um, to help uh, push this uh, journey forward. Right. Well, look, I mean, I couldn't agree with all of you more. Uh, certainly from our perspective at EY, um, spatial computing is coming. We see increasing demand all the time. The internet at the front end is changing. With Web3, the internet at the back end is changing, and we're creating a whole economy and a trading platform. And then AI is making the internet really smart. So there's a disruption coming. If we think the internet and being connected and doing business together in a virtual and digital manner is important, all of that is changing and we're at the, the really exciting time, so we're seeing that happen now. So I'd like you to um, say a big thank you to the panel and um, we'll see you all afterwards, thank you.